you know, those of you who are here, I want to thank you very much for coming this evening to listen to um, Dr. Professor Evan Gearing and his talk. Um, Dr. Evan Gearing is an evolutionary and behavioral biologist. He uses molecular approaches to investigate diverse and timely topics, including emerging diseases, species invasions, and behavioral health. Uh, his numerous research program conducted here at NSU will test how social bonds between dogs and humans impact each species at the subcellular level. So, Dr. Gearing, thank you so much for being with us this evening. I know I am very excited to listen to this talk. I'm an animal and a dog lover myself, so I'm look, very excited to um, learn all about this topic. So with that, Dr. Gearing, go ahead and take on over. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen here. Let's see. Um, share. And then uh, I'll put this on full screen. All right, is the screen visible and working? You're all set. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, some research that's uh, underway currently in my lab. I'm going to start by telling you about some research I've done in the past to show you the kinds of questions I'm interested in and, and problems I like to tackle. Um, and I'm also going to try and squeeze in just a little bit of uh, general perspective and opinion advice about um, graduate school and approaches to graduate study. Um, so the first is that Graduate school, I think, can be really quite valuable to a lot of students, a lot of people. It's it's very different from an undergraduate degree in that you have more responsibility and more opportunity to kind of um, tailor your work and your focus um, to something that you are um, personally, that you've selected personally and are very passionate about. Um, it always helps to have an advisor who knows a fair bit about the topic that you're interested in and it can help you develop your ideas. Um, and they don't necessarily have to lead you um, to a, a job or a next step in the exact area of the research. They just have to align with your interests and goals. And as long as you, um, as long as you're willing to take the initiative uh, to take leadership over your graduate study, and stay open to opportunities and uh, twists and turns that might come along in your life during the time you're a graduate student, then um, I think it can be a pretty rewarding experience. Um, and I also uh, want to say that myself and most of my colleagues here at, at NOVA who advise graduate students or are interested in advising graduate students, um, we, we have our own research objectives and we really hope that graduate students can help us meet them. But we're also, you know, our, our main focus in taking on a student to mentor is making sure that um, we help you advance to the next stage in your professional and intellectual growth. And so um, the research that I'm designing here, you'll see at the end, is really um, kind of a, a fork in the road for me in terms of my research focus. And that's been done partly to align what I do with um, the interests and needs of the Nova student population. OK, so at the end, also, you'll, you'll see that um, my current research involves dogs. I just want to put all this stuff at the front end of the talk so I don't lose anyone in the audience. Um, if you're not a dog person, that's OK. I'll explain to you why. This research um, can help us understand general things about biology and about human health. Um, and I also welcome uh, uh, cat, cat enthusiasts um, to talk to me uh, about, about this work or, or other things. Um, so please feel welcome, uh, even if you're not as enthusiastic about dogs as, um, uh, as some of us are. OK, so today's talk is going to include two examples of past projects that have nothing to do with dogs whatsoever, or um, maybe just a little bit. But uh, um, And then I'm going to give you a, a really quick overview of my current research efforts. Um, I just said mine, but actually these are collaborative efforts that involve other NSU faculty. So the work with the dogs um, already involves uh, a lot of collaboration with Dr. David Feldman who advises future um, forensic psychologists in NSU's College of Psychology. And the lab work is, um, is being conducted in collaboration with Dr. Andrew Osga, who's on the, on the conference today. And um, he's a, a peer in the Department of Biology um, here at NOVA in the Holmos College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so um, I also wanna just mention in case, any, in case this information is helpful to anyone, over the last two years, my collaborators and I have also worked on measuring SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. And we did that work in collaboration with Broward County. But that research was recently concluded. And um, my personal focus at this time is, um, is this new project with, um, with uh, canine human social bonding. 
Um, but if you're interested in epidemiology or public health, um, then come and talk to me about that work or um, read our, uh, our preprint that's up on MedArchive um, because uh, um, uh, that was a really interesting uh, detour from, from the body of work that I'm gonna show you now. Um, so the first case study that I'm going to tell you about um, was the focus of my postdoctoral research, and that involved looking at the evolution of feral and invasive animals, um, <clears throat> especially feral animals. I, I became interested in understanding how these animals evolve after they leave captivity, because uh, biologists since Charles Darwin, as soon as the minute we had evolutionary theory, we had all kinds of verbal predictions or explanations about what happens to domestic animals when they go wild, why they can't succeed in the wild. We have, dom we have feral domestics, feral cats, feral pigs, feral dogs all over the world. Um, and yet nobody had actually really bothered to study them uh, and to, especially to use all of these genetic tools we have now using DNA sequences to ask what's really going on with these animals. Are they sort of stuck with a domesticated genome, um, or are they evolving? And if so, is that undoing what we did when we domesticated them? Or what's the story? And I think that's a really interesting question that can tell you a lot about the reversibility of evolution and about these animals that have um, helped spread disease or influence ecosystems around the planet, but have been sort of ignored because a lot of wildlife biologists find them just very mundane and boring. Um, um, I don't, uh, and that's mainly because as an evolutionary biologist, I'm really interested in how natural selection and artificial selection and um, sexual selection, how all these different um, pressures that, that confront animals in their daily lives influence their evolution across uh, many generations. And uh, the minute that an animal goes feral, so have a look at this pig escaping, uh, escaping from this pen, the minute they leave captivity, they experience a very abrupt and a very strong change in selection regimes and the forces that determine whether they'll survive and uh, how many offspring they'll leave behind. Um, and that includes you know, changes in the social environment. So this pig, when he leaves the pen, he's no longer con confined to interacting with the group mates the farmer chose for him or her. Um, it's it's a, a scramble competition and um, in the wild. Uh, the food, the food base, the diet will change. Uh, the pathogens uh, will will they'll experience uh, different pathogens and uh, face new predators. Um, the 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 level and forms of competition for territories and mates will change because they're not stuck inside of a box anymore. And um, they leave uh, behind an environment where we provide maybe a, a water trough and some shade um, for whatever is is out there in the wild. And if you think about it, all of these changes should, should potentially influence which traits are best. So you're going to want a different immune system if you're in a, in a captivity with an antibiotic-enriched diet than what you would want if you were out there in this scrubby desert um, uh, drinking the water that's out there. Um, and so you could, you could make all kinds of predictions, but none of these had been really formally tested when I picked up this research program. Um, so the first thing that I did is I pulled together some colleagues uh, who are experts on different topics uh, that I know a little bit about, or, or maybe a fair bit about, animal behavior, genomics, uh, conservation biology, and we started brainstorming um, to sort of formalize these predictions about what are the factors that would influence the evolution of a feral population. And those include things like genetic bottlenecks uh, during domestication and when animals escape into the wild, um, artificial selection by humans, adaptation to domestic to captive settings. Um, and so, uh, so, so then we started to look for any research that had been done on feral animals that would sort of tease apart how these different factors influence their success or failure in the wild. And um, we realized there, there, again, there just wasn't very much research out there. Um, and so the first thing we wanted to do is create a map for other scientists to say, here are the, the factors that we need, to, uh, we need to start paying attention to when considering this process of what we call feralization, the process of an animal descending across generations outside of captivity. And then we picked a case study. Uh, we did not pick the dog. We didn't pick the cat. We didn't pick the pig for a variety of reasons. Um, the most tractable, the most uh, easy animal to study, 
um, to start answering these questions turned out to be the feral chicken. And so uh, we went to a few parts of the world where you find a whole lot of chickens. Um, the most notable of these was the island of Kauai in the Hawaiian archipelago, way out in the middle of the Pacific. Um, you find chickens everywhere on this island. So you see one here perched atop of a, of a um, guardrail on a highway overlooking these taro ponds. Um, here's another one on this beautiful beach. Here's one living in a very dry desert um, habitat that's uh, part of a protected um, dry forest. Here are uh, many feral chickens living in the Walmart parking lot. Um, and here we did hop over a couple islands and spotted a feral chicken on the newest land on earth, this um, freshly flown lava from the Kilauea volcano. So you've got um, uh, volcanologists here at the edge of the flow. If you walk onto this thing, it will melt the soles off the shoes, uh, off your shoes. And so um, what this really shows you is these animals are tremendously successful and they've, they've sort of figured out how to live in, a, in an incredible variety of habitats. So I think when we, when, when we make the assumption that domestication leaves animals maladapted for the wild, they're not gonna be able to make it out there. Um, we're just ignoring a lot of evidence that's right in our face um, that, that shows us that that's not necessarily true. Now, I'm not going to have time to tell you all of the details, but we spent a lot of, we spent a lot of time, we did a lot of DNA sequencing, and we collected a lot of field data to try and figure out exactly why these chickens are so successful. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can talk to me, ask a question in the Q&A, or um, check out the papers, the series of papers that we've published on this population. Um, but I'll tell you just a little bit about um, some of our general findings. So our first question was, um, where did these chickens come from? If we want to know how they're evolving, we sort of need to identify the source population or populations so that we have some point of comparison. And there were two different stories about this um, that were told by the locals. Um, one was that the Polynesians had brought red jungle fowl across the Pacific to Hawaii. We actually know that part is true. Polynesians brought these red jungle fowl, which are sort of the wolf of the chicken world. It's the same species, but it's wild. It's never been domesticated and they live all over the forests of Asia. Um, well, so one, one, uh, one story was that the earliest Hawaiian colonists brought these birds with them in their canoes and they had survived all the way into the present. Now that last bit we weren't sure about because um, you don't find red jungle fowl um, or feral chickens on several of the Hawaiian islands. And um, it gets kind of hard to find fossils of these birds um, in the recent past. So, so um, that left us sort of scratching our heads. Uh, others in Hawaii said that um, these were just domesticated chickens that had gone feral. And for that to be the case, this would have to be sometime in the very recent past, in the last few centuries, because the Hawaiian Islands, the Europeans who domesticated the chicken um, didn't actually, uh, well, who created the, the, the domesticated chickens we find all over the world today, they didn't arrive in Hawaii um, until 1778 AD. So it would have, have, have to have been um, sometime after that um, that this population was introduced if it was um, just a, a feral domestic chicken. Um, so we did some DNA sequencing and the punchline was that the DNA sequence analyses showed that actually this was a hybrid population. So it's a, it, there's, a, a, there's been a crossing of the gene pools of the red jungle fowl, which is the, the wild chicken as it were from Asia and domesticated chickens. So these, these genes of, the, of these different animals have been combined, they've collided in the Hawaiian islands. I want you to imagine instead, it might be an easier thought exercise that say we took a whole bunch of wolves and a bunch of dogs, which can interbreed, they can mate with each other and, and have pups. So let's just imagine that we threw them on an island together and then we wait a bunch of generations. Um, so what's gonna happen? Well, um, I ask this question in interactive seminars all the time and in the predictions, the general predictions are always the same. The wolf genes will win because the dog genes will suck in a wild environment. Um, but it actually turns out we, we did some other uh, population genomic analyses. It actually turns out that's not the whole story. 
So some of the some of the gene variants, the alleles or the DNA sequences that we find in this Kauai population today did arrive uh, with the red jungle fowl ancestors. And these genes tend to control things like the development of the brain and the maternal care behavior that, that mothers provide their young. Now this makes sense because um, we don't really we don't really select for maternal care in domestic settings. We take the eggs, we incubate them, we protect the young. So we've sort of taken over the role of the mother in um, agro-industrial chicken farming. But uh, when they go feral, they don't they don't have help with with uh, motherhood anymore or henhood. So um, so it, it was it, it once we. Once we figured out that that some of these genes that are important for the the maternal behavior um, were undergoing strong selection in the Kauai chickens, it, it sort of made sense to us. But then again, uh, there were some some other genes where the the version of the DNA sequence, the genetic code that came from the domesticated chickens, was winning, was was enriched in Kauai after many generations of selection. So why would that be? Well, I need to tell you a little more about the difference between these animals. So a red jungle fowl will lay about five eggs a year and domesticated chickens can lay up to 300. And as soon as you hear that, well, then of course, it sort of stands to reason that um, you might see domesticated genes um, winning sometimes when domestic and wild animals interbreed and form a hybrid feral population. This is very common actually, that, that scenario. Um, but we were really the first ones to show that that can happen. And um, I think that has some important consequences for what we might expect about um, uh, future uh, invasions of, of uh, domestic animals into wild ecosystems where they can compete with endangered species and spread disease and so on. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting and a, a, a consequential finding that both of these gene pools contributed to adaptive evolution in these feral hybrids. Um, and it's interesting that this chiefly involved uh, um, evolution of domestication related traits, things we modified when we developed chickens, the body size, the growth rate, the number of eggs they lay in a year, um, but it didn't involve the same gene. So sometimes these chickens um, were, uh, uh, are evolving through rapid uh, changes or, or, or because of selection at different genes than the ones that we know from the domestication literature um, were changed when the red jungle fowl was developed into the chicken by our ancestors. So that was kind of an interesting and unexpected result. And that actually um, disagrees with the really um, simple predictions that Darwin and many others have made that if you took a domestic animal and threw it into the wild, it would just sort of reverse the evolutionary changes that we instilled when we domesticated these uh, creatures. Um, and I just want to show you some of the other things we can do with um, studies of feral animals. And as soon as we started, um, my uh, collaborators and I started calling scientists' attention to these animals, we sort of got this pile on of people from lots of different subdisciplines interested in this research area. So uh, one, one example is just this schematic here is it, all that it's really showing you is that um, the, uh, the microbes that live in the digestive systems of feral chickens are different from those of domestics and different from the red jungle fowl ancestor. And that again, isn't especially surprising, but it's promising because one of our biggest problems today is that, um, that our, our meat production, um, it relies on a really heavy use of antibiotics. We, we, uh, we, we feed chickens really large doses of antibiotics that accelerates their growth rates and also um, protects them from some diseases. In, in that way, we were able to produce a lot of eggs a year, a lot of chicken wings in a, in a year. Um, but the problem is that overuse of antibiotics leads to antibiotic resistant pathogens that make their way into the human population. And, and they're huge problems when uh, it's, it's a huge problem for, um, for hospitals when they get outbreaks of these pathogens. So we're, we're trying to reduce our reliance on antibiotics in agriculture. And one of the ways we can do that is through, uh, through probiotics, through finding microbes we can give to cows or chickens or pigs that, um, that would fortify them against pathogens 
without um, delivering these antibiotics that we need um, for the human population. And this, this, um, uh, these findings for, of, of unique uh, microbes in the guts of feral chickens um, suggest maybe we could find something there. Maybe some of these pathogens can be developed as probiotics and then, um, and then delivered to industrial chickens. So um, that was kind of a, an interesting finding with some, some other potential um, useful results. So the feral microbiomes, they're more diverse than domestics. They have different antibiotic resistance, and they contain some lineages that have never previously been found in chickens or red jungle fowl. Um, so in general, that, that case study shows us that studying feral animals can let us uh, study rapid evolution in a human altered world in species with economic, agricultural, and ecological significance. Um, we see genomic changes at genes that control a wide variety of traits, including behavior, physiology, and morphology. And we see that surprisingly, both the, the domesticated alleles or, or DNA sequences and the, um, uh, the wild type ones that came from the red jungle fowl, both have been sort of important in creating these, what we like to call um, feral super chickens um, uh, that are thriving on the island of Kauai. And, um, and then for uh, current or future graduate students, a good take home is that research topics that can impact our food base, our health, and our understanding of evolution are all hiding in plain sight all around us. So um, I picked up this, um, this research project after doing a study of insects in Hawaii and seeing these chickens everywhere and wondering why nobody was studying them. It just seemed to me right there in front of us were some really exciting research opportunities. And that's one of the things that I try to instill in mentored students is um, that you know there there are research opportunities all around us. You don't have to you don't have to travel to remote corners of the world or um, or use ten million dollar instrumentation to make important discoveries. Okay, so um, part two, I'm going to tell you quickly about another research project. Um, this one is close to my heart because I think this parasite is the most interesting and bizarre thing that I ever heard about when it was introduced to me, it completely blew my mind. And I love talking about it because if this is new to you, you you'll probably think that I'm crazy and you probably won't believe some of the things I'm going to tell you, uh, but they are true. So the second part is about how this crazy cat parasite hijacks our brains. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna study this by using a hyena uh, model, but um, I'll show you. Um, I'll show you why that matters for us. Okay, so parasites are everywhere. There are more described species that are parasites than non-parasites. That's already pretty interesting, right? Um, well, this Pokemon character is based on a really uh, bizarre, well, a very interesting fungus, Cordyceps, that um, infects, uh, um, uh, in, it infects insects, infects arthropods. And um, uh, the, the figure on the left shows you a cicada um, with the, the this this fungus, um, uh, it it gets into the um, the hemolymph, which is sort of like the blood of the the insect. It modifies um, the the function of the insect's brain. In the case of the cicada, it causes it during the best time of year for the fungus, which I believe is the dry season. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I reviewed this, but the, anyhow, the cicada at the right time of year climbs to the tip of a branch, grabs on, holds on and just stays there. And then the fruiting body of this, uh, this fungus um, bursts out of its head capsule, killing the insect, and disperses its spores into the wind and lands on other insects to start its life cycle over again. So um, what, what that's suggesting is that this, this parasite is not only um, exploiting this animal, it's actually controlling its behavior in order to get around in the landscape, which is um, a little scary and also very impressive. In terms of what evolution can can the sophistication of traits that evolution can produce, even in a um, even in a fungus. Um, so now uh, I'm going to tell you about the world's most common parasite, as far as we know, which is Toxoplasma gondii. It is a single-celled protist. It's related to malaria. It's in the same group of parasites that cause malaria and, and some other um, important diseases in humans and other animals. Um, it can infect when it infects a, a host, whether that's a human or a bird or a mammal or, or another mammal species, 
it can infect every type of tissue in the host. So it can infect the ocular tissue, the eyes, the brain, the liver. Um, it can spread throughout the body. This is a one-celled organism that's just sort of replicating in the host and, and spreading itself around. Um, so who has it? Um, well, uh, in, here within the US, about 40 million residents, which is 10% of all people over the age of six have this parasite in their bodies. So. Um, you know, if you look around a if you look around a regular undergraduate classroom, I've usually got about forty students in my genetics class. Um, that means four of them have this parasite, right? So it's it's all around you. Um, it may be in you. Uh, and um, if we look worldwide, it's uh, between twenty an estimated twenty to fifty percent of all humans worldwide. So the average infection rate is a little higher in a lot of countries um, than it is in the U.S. But that's 4 billion people hosting this parasite. Um, every terrestrial mammal that's been well studied, so you can take your pick, uh, black bears, raccoons, wolves, tigers, uh, ha has some fraction of the population will have this parasite and also many bird species have the parasite. So it's all around the world. It's in lots of things. It's in lots of us. Um, humans can get infected in several ways, and this is going to be kind of important in a minute to, to follow this, although it's a little confusing. So these include, um, you can ingest a spore contaminated soil or water. So if you're out in the playground and you're eight years old and you touch some soil that has the spores of this parasite in it and touch your mouth, you can end up infected that way. Um, you can also get it uh, by eating undercooked meat, and you can also get it from your mother if your mother acquires the parasite during pregnancy. How would she do that? Well, um, the spores are shed only by cats. And um, the, if, if a woman handles the cat litter while pregnant, um, she can acquire the parasite and then um, pass it on to the offspring. So this is one of the reasons you might have heard that pregnant women are discouraged from handling cat litter um, so that they don't become infected and um, pass the parasite to the newborn or to the, to the, neon, to the in, uh, fetus, yeah. Okay, so um, does it matter? Well, most human infections are benign, meaning they don't, um, they don't cause major uh, uh, harm to, to the human host, um, but we do get some symptomatic cases and these result in a condition called toxoplasmosis. So immunocompromised individuals with toxoplasmosis, they can experience all kinds of health problems like brain inflammation, confusion, seizures, coma, lung infections and vision loss. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip this part about, um, uh, about the medication for toxoplasmosis and um, just wanna make sure that we end on time um, so we can have questions if you have any. But so even healthy humans, this, this is the part that might start to really catch your attention. Even healthy humans and lab rodents who are infected with this parasite show measurable changes in their hormones, in their brain physiology, including levels of important neurotransmitters like dopamine and in their behavior. So for example, infected human women in, uh, in uh, blind uh, psychological standardized tests um, will score more sociable than women who are not infected, whereas infected men um, will score um, as more neurotic. Uh, I consider myself very neurotic and was surprised to learn that I am not infected. Um, but on average in the population, there's this really interesting effect and also fascinating that it is sex specific. So males and females show different, um, uh, different changes if infected with this parasite. Prior studies have also found that humans who are infected have si higher suicide rates. They're more likely to be in car crashes. They're more likely to be schizophrenic than uninfected peers. Um, I do just want to mention, though, that um, uh, um, some of these studies have been challenged. There's unquestionably an effect of this parasite on the, mam the mammalian host's um, hormone levels and neurotransmitters. We can measure this rigorously in lab mice, um, but the problem is there, there have been so many tests where people go looking for a, a correlation between infection and something like suicide rate. Um, and a, a lot of scientists will sometimes see these uh, studies people will publish and say we need to be a little cautious about um, about false positives, uh, about um, reaching uh, conclu conclusions too early from some of those studies. So, okay, anyhow, 
uh, why is that happening? Well, this manipulation of the host behavior, of human behavior, uh, um, is understood to be uh, a trait like the one that we saw in that fungus that kills its insect hosts that has evolved to help this parasite get around the world. Um, so how would that work? Well, an infected mouse in the lab will show an increased att attraction to um, feline cues, to the scent of feline urine. And infected mice also show increased behavioral boldness. So they will, they will wander into areas that uninfected mice would avoid. <clears throat> the parasite also has some, uh, some genes. It, it has some uh, tricks up its sleeve, including genes that can modulate dopamine levels in host brains. So this is all pointing towards this idea that the, the changes that these hosts experience are actually caused by the parasite. Um, and um, that perhaps the parasite is trying to get around the world by finding its way into a cat. Why would it need to get into a cat? Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, the only way this parasite can make spores, which are stable in the environment, which can be shed by the, by the millions from its host and sit in the dirt and infect another host, the only way to make those, those spores is within the gut of a feline species. It has to be a house cat or a tiger or a lion, it has to be a cat of some kind. Otherwise, the only way it can get from host to host is if that host is eaten fresh and it's in one host. And then if that host is eaten, it's in the next host. But if it gets to the cat, it gets to recombine its genome through the, the diploid sexual stage of its life with any other parasites, uh, any other T. gondii parasites that are present in the cat's gut and then shed billions of spores. So it's sort of like the evolutionary jackpot getting into the cat. The idea here is that, oh, this manipulation of the, the um, rodent brain probably evolved to help the parasite do that. Because if you're in an infected mouse and you make it sort of uh, schizophrenic, uncoordinated, attracted to cat urine odor, it increases the likelihood that this host would get eaten by a cat um, and uh, help you win the evolutionary lottery. Um, but no study has actually proven that um, these effects, these behavioral effects of the parasites um, actually in, in, impact the host's survival in nature. So we set out to do that using hyenas. And um, we chose this species, the spotted hyena, um, uh, because we had excellent uh, behavioral data on hyenas um, from a group of, of scientists at Michigan State who've been following them for 30 years. The lead of this, Kay Holkamp, is the sort of Jane Goodall of the uh, hyena world. She knows as much about these animals as anyone. And for the population she's been studying, she's got 30 years of notebooks recording everything they eat. She knows them all as individuals. So do her students. They can identify them based on their spotting patterns. And um, uh, they can tell you who had kids with who and who fought with who for, for years and years. So this is a great, great data set um, for looking at behavioral um, uh, behavioral correlates of infection in, in wild animals, and also for asking whether or not they actually affect these animals' survival and um, how many how many offspring they leave behind, which is sort of the currency of fitness in evolutionary biology. Okay, so can T. gondii increase boldness and or ilurophilia, which is today's word of the day? It means love of cats. Um, well, we used um, ELISA uh, assays of antibodies to the T. gondii parasite from darting sessions in the Maasai Mara region of Kenya shown here. And we compared infection status with experimental and observational data. I'm gonna go through this really fast. So I have time for the dog project. We found that infected hyena cubs approach lions more closely during these um, aggressive interactions between the, the, the lion and, or violent interactions between the lions and the hyenas. Um, so that's a danger, we know that's a dangerous thing for cubs to do. Um, and so the, the fact that the infected um, cubs get closer to lions than uninfected ones does support this idea that maybe the parasite is manipulating boldness and maybe that is putting the host at risk of um, predation by a feline. Um, we also found a marginally significant effect uh, where infected hyenas were more likely to die from uh, by being killed by a lion. So again, this supports this idea that um, the parasite is manipulating the host brain to its own advantage and at the expense of its host. 
And then we asked whether toxoplasma was more prevalent in human disturbed areas, just to learn a little more about what are the factors that would lead to exposure of humans and wildlife to this parasite. Um, here we kind of um, uh, had a, um, uh, we had a marginally significant effect. It wasn't, we expected to see something more pronounced here. Um, we thought that, you know, around villages where there are domestic animals that can host this parasite grazing, um, that there would be a higher incidence of T. gondii, that more, more animals would be infected. We got a marginally significant effect, but um, it, it wasn't as pronounced as we thought. So um, I, uh, sometimes you don't get the result you expect. And we think this just means that um, the, the, the parasite is really good at spreading around the landscape um, from whatever hosts it, find it finds itself in. Um, OK, so I'm going to skip this part, too. And I'm just going to um, I'm just going to tell you that um, uh, that this parasite isn't just in humans, mice, and hyenas. But if we take like farms, for example, you see these domestic animals. Um, uh, the high, high percentage of, of all the chickens on African farms and uh, feral cats on African farms also have this parasite, um, and um, this sort of makes me wonder if it's in 20 to 50 percent, you know, up to half of all the humans worldwide, if it's in all these domestic and wild animals, this is the same species. It's the same single cell parasite in the brains of all these animals. We've seen that it measurably alters human uh, and mouse behavior. We've now shown that that can influence in at least one species and probably many others um, survival in the wild and who eats who. It really just makes you wonder, does this, you know, how strong is the influence and hand of this parasite in ecosystems all around the world? So these are my favorite kinds of research topics to, um, to look at. I like to tackle really big and exciting questions. And um, I'm kind of really interested in um, trying to do um, the work that not necessarily the most technically challenging work, but work that that really nobody has picked up and run with um, with yet. And I, I do often lean heavily on collaborators. None of this work would have been possible without uh, 30 years of, of um, behavioral observations, without a giant freezer full of uh, blood samples for these hyenas, and without a very um, generous collaborator who let me do the, the diagnostics for toxoplasma and try and figure out what we could learn from that. Okay, so what's next? Uh, um, this is on deck in um, uh, my, my research group and my collaborators groups. Um, during the pandemic shutdown, it uh, became pretty hard for most of us to do research. And so um, Dr. Oska and I turned our attention toward measuring um, COVID, uh, measuring SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes uh, COVID-19 in wastewater. And, um, you know, I, uh, I really enjoyed that detour, um, but I'm not a public health expert. I'm not a virologist. And um, I really kind of missed working with genetics uh, with, um, you know, some of the, the specific molecular approaches that I'd used in the past, and especially working with wild and domestic animals with vertebrates. Um, working with Broward County wastewater was very, Stinky. Uh, it was not the, it, it, but it's not really. Uh, anyway, it was a great project. It just wasn't a great fit for my background and expertise. Let me put it that way. Um, but the pandemic also gave us a lot of time to think, and we saw a lot of social unrest during the pandemic. And I did start to wonder well, this feral chicken work, I can explain how it connects to agriculture and, you know, alternatives to antibiotic overuse. But um, that stuff is all pretty far away from the research. I thought it might be nice to see if I could take the the tools that I have and get them a little closer um, to some applications to human health and wellness, especially given that most of my students here at Nova Southeastern are very interested in um, human health and well-being. Um, and one of the things that I remembered was that uh, when I was younger, it's been about 20 years ago now, I worked in a prison mail room during one summer. I needed a temp job. I went and took a typing test at the Capitol and they gave they, they offered me three jobs. And I was, you know, sort of fascinated by the opportunity to, to see the inside of a prison and work in the mailroom. Um, and it was a really interesting job. Uh, it was very depressing in a lot of ways. I think there are a lot of things about our criminal justice system that are, are not conducive to uh, rehabilitation um, or to um, 
uh, one moment. I'm just going to make sure that everything is working. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, um, so uh, any our, our prison our prison system needs a lot of work. Let me put it that way. Um, but the one thing that I saw in the Nebraska State Penitentiary that really made me more hopeful and optimistic about um, about the justice system was this program that brought dogs into prison for training by inmates because you give people who are stuck behind bars an opportunity to do something meaningful and useful to help animals and help society and to experience unconditional love um, in an environment. A lot of these people have, you know, a lot of these people arrive in this system um, because of, uh, because they, they, they've, they haven't been handed a great lot in life to begin with. Um, and uh, working with a dog really can be for many inmates um, uh, a transformative experience. That's what anyone who runs these programs will tell you. There are data to show that for every dollar that goes into these programs in terms of how much it reduces reoffense, um, that uh, we save over $1,400. Um, and so, you know, both from a very brass tax uh, financial perspective, from a data perspective, and from a humanistic perspective, they're they're great programs. They really mean the world to the dogs and the inmates. Um, uh, and uh, nobody's nobody's studying these, uh, at least not the, the biological um, impact of this. So what I want to know is uh, really when you and your dog fall in love with each other, what's happening inside of your cells? We know that the mind body connection is real. Only people die younger, they get sick more often. But we all we know about how that works is this really basic stuff about stress hormones that circulate throughout the whole body. And if you look at other conditions like cancer or heart disease, we know a lot more about them. We know all the way down to the level of, you know, DNA hypermethylation of specific genes and uh, and, and like proteins that facilitate metastasis, but that mind-body connection is, is, is very difficult. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to study um, and we know so little about it. And when we know more about it, it's gonna be really valuable to advancing medicine. So how would you study that? Well, we've got these programs like when I mentioned where you take humans who are born to be social, dogs who are born to be social, um, send them into the worst social environment you can imagine, which is a, a prison cell for a person and a dog shelter for a dog, and then bring them together. And what you've just done is you've created a sort of, I mean, you haven't created, we're not going to, we're not going to put any animals in bad conditions to study them. But what's already happened, just because of the way that we manage, um, stray animals and, um, and, uh, convicted offenders, um, you've created the, the control that is kind of the worst social environment that one of the worst social environments that you could imagine. And then you've given an opportunity for social enrichment. So I, I want to be able to measure like, what is that? What is that bond actually doing to the genes and cells of the dogs and the people? And I think we'll be able to measure some um, significant effects there. And I think they'll teach us a lot more of, of, about general um, things, uh, general ways that our social worlds affect our physical health and um, our bodies um, down below the level of hormones that are circ circulating in the blood. So we want to look at that. Um, our tools are going to include some mtDNA gene expression profiling, also hormone analyses, along with some behavioral surveys that our psychology team is going to help us with. And um, our pilot studies are going to start, you know, simpler. We're not going to just go barreling into prison and ask for permission to disrupt everybody's life to do this. We're going to start by looking at um, what's happening in the cells of animals, of dogs that are transiting through the Broward County shelter. And we're also going to look at some humans outside of prison settings that are experiencing stress or wellness. So students before and after their MCATs, for example. Um, we're also reviewing the current landscape of dog and prison programs, and this is probably, you know, a multi-year effort, but once we've got all of this tackled, then we can hopefully um, get some biological data from the dogs and the, and the inmates that are working together in these programs and show what they're doing. Um, so that's about it. I have to acknowledge the organizers of this talk. Leave a minute for questions if you have any. Um, my collaborators and... Um, uh, all of my undergraduate students, um, I thought I had a picture of them in here. Where did that go? It was right there. Well, I have wonderful undergraduates. So if you as a grad student are looking for a project, the thing that I'm really excited about at some point is, is, is uh, having graduate students work with the undergraduates because they're very bright and motivated and 
I don't have enough time in the day to, um, uh, to interact with them and, and give them individual attention as much as I want. I think that's a really valuable opportunity for graduate students to get some mentorship experience. So um, um, that's about it. I'll, um, I'll hand the I'll hand the Zoom over. I'm gonna um, stop my screen share now and um, I'll take any questions if you have them. Awesome, well, thank you very much for securing. That was, that was absolutely fascinating to find a lot about that stuff. That was great. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to you know type in the in the chat um, or Q and A and I will you know moderate them to Professor Gearing. Well, while people think of some professor, I do know that I have a couple for you as well. <laughs> um, so just going back to, you know, you said you were out in Hawaii and you were able to do all that research and everything. You know, what was that your initial reason for going out there? Or did that just kind of happen by default? I mean, I so I've sort of been following, I, like I just kind of tumble from one research uh program into another one. So my PhD work was on an insect, and that insect um he has this really interesting, so there, I, I've just been teaching my genetic students that there are very few traits that are controlled by a single gene. And they're, they're really, it's really interesting to study those traits because you can, you can test some evolutionary theory that gets really messy when you're dealing with lots of genes. So human height, for example, there are a lot of genes on a lot of chromosomes that determine how tall you are along with how much milk you drank and whatever. But, um, but so when you can find a trait that's, that's like, has a big effect on how an animal does in the wild, but it's one gene controlling it. Um, that's kind of a cool opportunity to, to test some evolutionary theory. So I was doing that with this, this dragonfly like thing It's a damselfly and it comes in, the females can either look like the males or look like the females and what was going on with that. So I was working on this um, in Texas. And then um, somebody clued me into this Hawaiian population that had really bizarre frequencies of the two different kinds of females. So I went to study that. And that's when I, you know, I did that for, I went back to the Hawaiian islands for a couple of years. I went to a couple islands and over in, in, in that time, it was impossible not to notice the chickens. So that's how that came to be. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Professor, we do have one question uh, from Mr. Brandon Hunter. Um, so he said, I found the toxoplasm gone interesting. Uh, how human behavior possibly half of all humans could have been possibly influenced by this parasite? Like, how did that become, how did that come about? Great question. Yeah. So I, you know, I usually give that as a 50 minute talk. This is the whole entirely about that parasite. And th there's a lot to kind of, you need to know. And so it was, it was a, um, it was sort of a trial run. And can I get this into like one third of a talk? Um, so let's see. Um, uh, the question I the question I, I'm, I I heard is sort of why does the parasite influence human behavior? So I I told you that if if it infects a mouse, then it makes the mouse more attracted to cat urine odor, and that makes it likely to be eaten by a cat, and all of that makes sense. But what about humans? Like, what's it doing in us? Um, is that, I think that's the question you were asking. And, and yeah, he was asking correct, how, how did that interact? How did it get to populate into humans? Like where did that transition? Oh, go? oh it's our fault. It's totally <laughs> our fault. So the reason, yeah. So what happened was uh, the Toxoplasma gondii used to be, uh, it sort of originated in Africa. And then um, as humans spread around the world um, and mainly as we developed agricultural systems and started storing grain, we created a sort of super highway around the world for rodents who would, you know, eat the corn and then follow people to the next village and get on their boats. And so we really like, we really changed the global ecosystem with stored grain when we started doing that, mostly in terms of like these mice, which we call them commensals. They live, they're, they're not pets, they're not wild. They just sort of live around, around human um, developments. And then once we spread those mice all over the world, then we started bringing cats all over the world. Why? Because they would kill the mice and that would protect our grain and stop the mice from spreading diseases to us like plague. So, um, uh, so um, the, the, the parasite moved around the world with humans 
mice and cats. And along the way, it went through some really, um, really um, uh, important, it picked up some really important mutations, genetic mutations um, that, uh, that made it much more spready. And then it, and then boom, it exploded all over the world. So that's how it got to be everywhere. And then just to answer the question you didn't ask, it, uh, our general idea is, oh, it just, it influences human behavior because we also use the same levers to control behavior as mice, even though our brains are a little different, but we use dopamine, we use testosterone, like these, um, the, the, the parasite is pushing on the levers. It's just evolved to get into a host and then start pushing on the levers that helped it drive the mice to the cats. And the unfortunate thing for us, even though we, very few of us get eaten by cats these days, um, or, or uh, is that our brains are just similar enough to the mouses that our behavior is affected. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. And Brandon says thank you as well. <laughs> Thanks um, everyone. So if we don't have any other talk, Professor, I'm sure you are busy with classes and getting going and everything. So Professor Gearing, thank you so much once again for you know volunteering to come talk to us about this. It was fascinating once again. Um, for thank those you. of you who came, thank you so much for attending. I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday evening um, and take care and look forward to hearing back from you guys all soon. Take care Thanks now. So much.